Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar series. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to the Manitoba Agriculture YouTube channel shortly after broadcast. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to Crop Talk for July 31st. It's, uh, it's amazing how fast uh, the year seems to be going by. We've uh, had a long, uh, long drawn out spring and uh, we're getting into the point where we're starting to see some combines being pulled out and actually uh, the odd field where of the winter crops that are starting to be uh, starting to be harvested. So uh, with that, I thought it was uh, maybe a good opportunity to get Tammy Jones on to talk a little bit about uh, pre-harvest and some of the things we should be looking at when we uh, uh, look at pre-harvest. I think uh, this year, more than any, we'll probably be seeing a fair bit of it just because of the uneven crop. And uh, also when we're out there spraying, uh, just to see maybe uh, some weed escapes that might've got away. And I thought it'd be a good time for Tammy to talk about some of the resistant weeds she's been seeing this year or talking to people about this year. So. Uh, I guess with that, we'll turn it over to Tammy, Laurie, and we'll start with her presentation. Okay, thanks. Um, so focusing on harvest aids, and then we'll touch a little bit on um, on the, the weeds after the fact, I guess, uh, or the resistant weeds. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to move my my slides here I seem to be frozen hmm oh there we go all right so harvest aids definitely we had a cool dry start to the season for most areas so there was some stagy emergence we've got some patches here and there but we also have thinner sands and that has resulted in a lot of weed patches and I've got some great pictures uh, to show that although I don't think anyone needs to go very far to see patches of weeds um, then with the late season moisture, that was a new life for late flushes of weeds. Also, it uh, really helped out some of the perennials. And then my least favorite of all is all those tillers that are out there and making sure that we're trying to manage those as well. So while there are chemical harvest aids, I don't want to forget that a swather can do a lot in some of these situations as well. So I will focus on the herbicides, but um, I don't mind a swather uh, as a concept if you haven't uh, already sold it. So harvest aids do have some precautions with them. It's very important that we're using them correctly, that we're following the label and that we're, you know, following that pre-harvest interval as well. Just because it's registered as a harvest aid, it doesn't mean you can spray it and then harvest whenever you want. There are some intervals that need to be followed for that as well. Residues, these pre-harvest applications, and we have lots of consumer awareness out there of um, maximum residue level limits. So um, detectable herbicide residues in the harvested grain are in that level is exponentially increased when we talk about pre-harvest application. So we certainly need to make sure that we know what the MRLs are for the market that we're headed to with the herbicide and the crop that we're using, and we can't push that limit at all. When it comes to registration, we need to be aware that even if it is registered, there are certain restrictions that some purchasers have on the pre-harvest use of herbicides, and so it's best to consult that buyer before we use it. Food safety, growers and advisors, and the advisors are essential in ensuring food health safety. We have everyone's um, safety in our hands. And be responsible. So the stewardship needs to be taken seriously. Okay, so that's my preachy side. Um, there are a number of herbicides that are registered as harvest aids or desiccants. Um, and there is a difference between those two. Um, so something like glyphosate is purely as a, a pre-harvest weed control it isn't a desiccant, whereas Diquat is the gold standard or has been in desiccants, and that's just dry down of plant material and not talking about weed control. So it uh, certainly depends on what your target is, what you would use, and it also depends 
on what crops you have, whether you're going to be able to use a particular product or not. So this table is directly out of the Guide to Crop Protection, and it tells you which products can be used theoretically based on registration in which crops. It does not talk about anything as far as MRL. And so there are other websites. Uh, Bryant Christie has a great website on MRL specifically and letting you know if there is an MRL established. But then there is also um, keeping it clean that will help you with any precautions as far as a particular product that may be registered in a crop but isn't uh, necessarily accepted in all end use markets. So again, um, these are the ones that are registered. I am going to focus on a few of them. So AIM or Clean Start, uh, Diquat, Glyphosate, and Heat. The Empower Good Harvest, which is a glufosinate product, is registered in a very limited number of situations. Um, everybody knows glufosinate through Liberty. It's a contact herbicide and water volume is key. And then uh, Flumioxacin or Valterra is again registered in a, in a limited scope and there are some end use concerns with certain markets as well. So I'm not gonna dive into them very far. Okay, so this is a fall rye field just outside of Carmen with um, many, many patches of annual weeds in it, which for me is not an expectation. I expect with a fall rye or a winter wheat crop that we have great broadleaf control but just the way the season turned out, we ended up with a lot of flushing weeds that managed to get through. So in here, there is some lambs quarters. This one also has curled bock and red root pigweed. Um, I expected to see more kochia, but closer to Carmen, there isn't maybe as much as there is uh, in some of the other areas of the province. So um, certainly there's seed set on most of these weeds that we're looking at and on harvest aid may help in minimizing that or minimizing the viability of that seed set, but it isn't going to prevent completely that seed set at, at this point in time. And if we zoom in a little bit closer, we just get another look of how those weeds are taking advantage of every particular um, opportunity that there is in that field. And the fall rye here, definitely ready for harvest. It's hard, it's crunchy, but there is an opportunity to possibly go in and just spray that for a um, desiccation of the weeds or um, killing those weeds off to help with your harvest operation. The other one that we're seeing a fair bit of is in canola actually. In a lot of the liberty tolerance systems, I am finding that lamb's quarters has managed to escape. And we'll touch on that a, a little bit later. Um, but there's a, a lovely lamb's quarters plant and I was doing a little bit of research for um, a particular retail and the good news is each lamb's quarters plant will only set about 70,000 seeds and the seed longevity, about 50% of that seed is no longer um, viable uh, 12 years after um, and even 20 years after, there was still about 30% seed viability. So it's longer lasting than maybe I thought. Now, one that glyphosate isn't particularly good on is buckwheat. And again, that's one where maybe the slother is an option or you need to go into some of those rapid dry down desiccation scenarios in order to get buckwheat because glyphosate is probably not gonna be the optimal uh, answer there. So if we're looking for weed control, there's something to consider there as well. Um, ideal staging for most weeds is in the bud to early bloom stage, whether it's a milkweed, which I'm seeing quite a number of patches of, or in this particular case, Canada thistle. If your thistle still looks like this particular one where the growing point is dead, certainly if you were generous, there is some green leaf material there, but that Canada thistle is, for all intents and purposes, dead, and there's no point in pre-harvesting it. You would need to have something much more um, like that first picture before you would use glyphosate for a pre-harvest weed control with Canada thistle. Okay, so let's, let's look at glyphosate a little bit more closely. So it is pre-harvest perennial weed control, not a desiccant. 
It does very little to increase the dry down rate. And I'll say it probably 20 times in here, but none of these products work at speeding up the maturity of the crop. Glyphosate is systemic, so it does move to the growing point, which just prior to physiological maturity is the seed. So it is very likely that there will be some glyphosate that can be moved to the seed. And that's why seed growers don't use glyphosate for um, seed crops. Now, if you're looking to straight combine, glyphosate can help even out that crop for easier harvest. You do need to keep in mind as to whether those tillers are going to be part of the harvest or whether they're going to dry down and not be in there. Because if the tillers are still green and that is seed fill, that's where most of your glyphosate is going to accumulate and that's where you could be risking some of the MRL. Um, the rate of dry down is dependent on environmental conditions. So if it's warm and sunny, that dry down is going to happen a lot quicker than if it's cool, uh, cloudy, that sort of thing. So you do need to set expectations that if you spray today, it's going to be you know, 10 or 14 days uh, before you see a lot of impact from that, and it may be longer before you start to um, before you start to harvest. You do need to leave about um, I think seven days is the pre-harvest interval, and I hope I have that in the slide later. If I don't, I'll look it up. Um, so Canada thistle, quackgrass, perennial south thistle, dandelion, toad flax, and milkweed are perennial weeds that do kind of fall into with this timing of pre-harvest weed control. Again, most of it is in the bud to bloom stage where the weeds are starting to send some of the sugars down into the root system rather than, um, you know, looking at growth. So when it's getting down into the root system, that's when it's the most effective. And all the target weeds should be green and actively growing at the time of application. So if it is fairly dry, and those weeds are slow growing, then expect slower activity on that weed. So seed moisture less than 30%, that's basically the, the guideline that is out there. So for wheat, barley, and oats, that's the hard dough stage. Keep in mind, not for milling oats or malt barley. In those cases, there's a lot of um, reasons why that glyphosate is not usually accepted. Uh, canola, pods green to yellow, 50 to 60% seed color change, uh, flax 75 to 80% or brown of uh, the bowls. Uh, the lentils and peas, we're talking about, um, you know, seeds that when you squish them, they, they stay in their, their two halves and the bottom pods rattle. Chickpeas, well, I think there's disease issues in most of the chickpeas. I'm not sure that we'll get to um, maturity for some of them. And then soybeans, Stems are green to brown, the pod tissue is brown and dry, dry beans, 80 to 90% leaf drop. And again, a caution that glyphosate is not accepted by all purchasers when it comes to dry beans, especially those um, that have consumers that are extremely sensitive to some of the perceptions around glyphosate. And faba beans, uh, those lower pods need to be dark brown or black. So the application timing is critical if it's too early, not only is there an MRL potential issue, but yield losses, and nobody wants that. So one of the things that I like to look at is the peduncle. Not everyone talks about that anymore, but on the left of this particular picture, which is from Minnesota, uh, there is a wheat spike that is clearly very green, and even the one in the middle is still green and still would be translocating sugars into the seed and therefore translocating some herbicide potentially into that seed as well, whereas the one on the right, that peduncle is now brown and you've reached physiological maturity and much less cause for concern at that type of staging. Okay, diquat. So Reglone and then some of the generics that are on the market now. It is a desiccant, so contact herbicide. It needs lots of water volume. It needs to somehow magically penetrate way down into the crop canopy to kill things off low down. Um, it does shut the plant down quickly. It can stop that plant from maturing completely. And so you can lock in some green seed in some, uh, some situations. So canola, you would want to apply it 90 plus percent ground seed. That means that the entire plant has 
a lot of the seed as brown, so 90%. And this is different than the seed color change where you're just looking at the main stem and you're looking at just a color change. Here we're looking for legitimately brown seed. Pulses, there's a bunch of caution signs on keeping it clean.ca with some of the different pulses and diquat use. So co consult with your exporter or your processor to make sure that you are able to market that product. Um, no need to have an unmarketable product. Like I said, high water volumes, which is typically two words, but I've got it as one here. Um, so in the, the guide, it says a minimum of 91 up to 222 liters per acre by ground. And if those numbers seem too high, then let's convert it to gallons per acre and go 20 to 50 gallons per acre. Probably seems too high for a lot of people still, but 20 really is the minimum that you want to be at as far as application rates for uh, something like a dye plot, which is a contact herbicide. When you're looking at aerial, 18 liters are about four and a half gallons per acre. You can harvest as soon as, or not you can, you should harvest as soon as the crop is dry. Um, I have an experience where we sprayed a crop and then it got rainy. And when we tried to get back in there to harvest, it was quite a bit of a gong show. The stems start to break down. You can start to see um, pods drop or pod shatter in canola, but you can see seed heads start to, you know, either lodge um, because of the weight or drop off completely as well. So do not delay uh, when you have Reglon applied. It is activated by daylight, um, and just like any other contact herbicide, if you apply it in the evening, it allows that herbicide to sort of penetrate and spread a bit more from the droplet contact point, and then sunny day the next day will give you great activation, and you'll get more complete uptake by the plant tissues that it does hit. It's not going to translocate into something low in the canopy that you didn't reach, but it will um, certainly do a better job of covering that, that plant. So staging... Like I said, canola, 90% or more of the seed is turned brown. When you're looking at dry beans and soybeans, 80 to 90% of the leaves are lost and 80% of the pods are yellow. Um, with faba beans, I've had challenges with getting down and killing the bottom part of the faba bean um, plant with diquat. So again, high water volumes, um, but you want those pods fully filled and a tan or black color on the bottom pods. Um, 75% of the bowl is brown with the flaxes, the lentils. You want um, pods to rattle at the bottom. Uh, there's condiment mustard registration as well. And that, again, you want to see uh, a good portion of the seed turned brown, 75% here. Um, rattling in the pea pods is similar to glyphosate staging for that one. Sunflowers. Um, 20 to 50 percent seed moisture and you want the back of the sunflower heads and those bracts to be turning yellow and a couple of odd ones or ones that I don't run into as often potatoes two weeks prior to harvest is the staging and then some of the alfalfas and clovers um, your pods need to be ripe but before shattering and then again a, a note to harvest within seven days now use high rates there's varying uh, rates for some of the crops so use the high rates for dense crops and and or heavy weed infestations and use high rates for canola and, and chickpea that's also recommended so carfentra zone which is a group 14 so that's your aim um, or clean start if you've got the premix it is registered for small grains like barley millet oat sorghum and wheat um, it uh, which i've repeated because i really wanted you to know that uh, the grain moisture needs to be less than 30% when it's um, tank mixed with glyphosate. You're de by default going back to that glyphosate label, um, and it will not speed up the maturity of the green crops. If you're using the AIM alone for dry bean and pea, the crop needs to be mature and the grain has begun to dry down. There is a note on the label to, that says, or according to AASC recommendations in the use area. And I don't know that there's any that differ from what's on the, the label. And then AIM plus glyphosate, again, 30% seed moisture applied to dry bean when 80 to 90% of the bean leaves have fallen and the pods are mature. Uh, dry pea, 75 to 80% of the pods are brown. And again, it does not speed up maturity. So, safflufenicil, which is heat, does have a change this year. Um, the pre harvest rate is officially 40 acres per case. Uh, 
whether it's tank mixed or used as a standalone. That 30 acre per case rate um, is no longer something that is supported by BASF. When it comes to heat plus glyphosate, the recommendation is 10 gallons per acre, um, but more is better. And we do have a slide later that will show some of that. And then BASF recommends five gallons per acre for aerial applications. For heat alone, we're looking closer to 20 gallons per acre, so very similar to the diquat. Coverage may not be adequate if there's dense or large weeds, so higher water volume is, again, better. And a reminder that there is no activity on grasses, so if you have wild oats or green foxtail, yellow foxtail, any of those types of weeds, then heat is not going to dry those down. Crop is usually ready 7 to 21 days after application. Those 21 days would be if it's cool, cloudy, rainy conditions, which I don't anticipate, but, you know, 7 to 10 days sort of thing, a little bit longer than Reglone, but maybe not as long as glyphosate. Canola application timing, 60 to 75% seed color change. BASF is saying 75%. Go to the, be cautious. The pre-harvest interval for canola is, is three days, and it is for many things. Um, when applied pre-harvesting canola, we're looking at the heat LQ tank mix with glyphosate. There still is that requirement for merge, and I should have mentioned that with diquat, um, that sometimes an, an adjuvant uh, rate will impact on the efficacy of, well, it will on all of these herbicides um, as well. So heat is activated by sunlight, sunny day maximizes its performance, and it is safe for seed production. Okay, so here's the pre-harvest intervals. You can see that for most of them, we're looking at um, three days. For chickpeas, it's two days after application. For sunflower, it is seven days after application. This, again, clearly, I've stolen it out of our guide to crop protection, but it is on the label as well. And those are important things to make sure that you're looking at. Okay, and the application stages we've um, sort of already talked about, but again, Generally, 30% seed moisture or less is uh, key for your small grain. Okay, the impact of water volume on heat. So I'm hoping that this is legible for you, but the first gray bar is glyphosate at 10 gallons per acre. The second bar, that sort of pink color, is heat plus glyphosate at 5 gallons per acre. The red bar is 10 gallons per acre of heat plus glyphosate. Then you get into more of that rust color, 15 gallons per acre with the tank mix. And then um, the darker colored bar is 20 gallons per acre. And we're looking at percent crop dry, dry down, zero to five days after application, six to 10 days after application, and 11 to 15 days after application. And you can certainly see that the trend is the more water volume you have, the better the dry down is, the more plant material you will dry down. So you need to set expectations when you're using a low water volume and heat plus glyphosate, that while it may be better than glyphosate alone as far as dry down, it's still going to be limited by coverage and by water volume. So uh, encouraging that 20 gallons per acre is where BASF is, is suggesting, but certainly that minimum of 10 gallons per acre to make sure that you're getting sufficient dry down. Okay, so this is a picture that was sent in by one of the retailers and wondering about lambs quarters in canola, what is going on this year. Uh, I don't think blaming the herbicide is the right thing because when I drive around the country, I can certainly see that there is weed issues in a lot of crops and there are many reasons for poor weed control. So lack of weed growth is one. A thickened cuticle with something like lamb's quarters is another. So both of those limit the uptake of the herbicide into the plant. The dry cool spring weather, so that plant isn't actively growing. If it's not actively growing, it's not sucking in the herbicide and it's not getting controlled as well. The other thing about the dry, cool spring weather is that you may be surprised at how quickly some of those weeds got out of stage. So you might have had a two-inch tall lamb quarter, but it had eight leaves on it, and it's getting dangerously hard to control 
eight leaf lambs quarters in those types of conditions. Dust can bind to um, a herbicide and it can also physically impede uptake by just covering that leaf. So the recommendation is always to check fields after application. Something like Liberty, you probably only need to wait a week, maybe two at the most to see if that second application is required. With some other herbicides, I saw glyphosate that worked very, very slowly and really didn't kick in until there was some moisture and that weed actively growing. And then it started to do its job with some crop competition. But in either case, there there were challenges and other herbicides had had the same issues. So I wouldn't blame the herbicide. I would blame some of those other conditions as why there might be some efficacy issues. So that brings me to herbicide resistance testing. And the other one that I've had a little bit of conversation about is things like kochia in flax. Well, kochia in flax with the product that was used, it's a suppression rating, flax not being in particularly competitive crop to begin with, and then the challenges of the growth, a growing season, I, I would suspect that that's not resistant. But if you are wanting to suss out those herbicide-resistant issues, then your weed patches are definitely most evident now. You have to take a look at the distribution of the escaped weeds. They tend to incur in patches as compo compared to a geometric pattern or a spray mist, and they don't tend to be throughout the field, like that lamb's quarters was. And that was, um, I would think, environment rather than resistance. Now, there is the possibility of reduced herbicide efficacy. Like I said, it was a challenging year. And then flushes of rain, which brings out second flushes, third flushes of different weeds, combined with a lack of crop competition. So, for instance, with wild oats, if I see wild oats now where the crop is mature and the wild oat is still green, I'm suspecting that that patch is probably a second or third flush, and it isn't a herbicide resistance issue. I, I'm happy for people to prove me wrong, but typically that wild oat that was sprayed with the first um, application of herbicide is likely mature at this point in time, and you're out there with a sweet net uh, scooping up and shattering out those um, mature seeds for uh, testing. Now, annual weed species like wild oat, green foxtail, cleavers, kochia, hemp nettle, smart weeds, oh, the list is endless, are more likely to develop resistance than your perennials. So it's unlikely that the perennials are, have developed herbicide resistance, never say never, but it's less likely. Resistant weed patches are usually a single species rather than a mix, which probably could be either um, a spray mist or a second flush. So, if you have weed escapes that you want to be confirmed as resistant or susceptible with testing, you need to have dry, mature seed. And for some of our weeds, that's currently too soon. So that lamb's quarters pictures, that's not dry, mature seed yet. And certainly with kochia, most of it isn't dry and mature at this point either. I think wild oats are pretty much your only option right now. So you do need at least 100 grams of small weed seeds, whether that's red root pigweed or cleavers and uh, 200 to 250 grams of large weed seeds like wild oats. So a couple cups for sure. And they do need to be uh, dried and then stored in like a paper bag. And if they're collected through um, just putting them through the combine and then gathering them afterwards, typically there's a lot of mechanical damage there. So you would need to uh, collect more in order to make sure that you have enough viable seed for um, testing. And Lionel tried to tell me that I needed to be shorter this time, so uh, I'm going to wrap up there, and hopefully I didn't go over my time limit, but I am willing to try and answer any questions. Okay, Tammy, it was, that, was, uh, that was great. Um, uh, I do have a question for you. Um, there's, uh, producers got uh, wheat with uh, lots of volunteer canola in it, almost like your lamb's quarters in the canola. And... Uh, it's Roundup tolerant, so I was just wondering what would be the the, uh, the answer to desiccating that one or reharvesting that one. Right. So certainly, um, I think any of the desiccants will do a decent job. I do know that heat is used in a lot of of the other um, or in all of the herbicide tolerant systems to help with dry down not only of the weeds, but of the canola as well. And uh, 
so maybe I don't have the best answer for you right now, but um, I, I think that most of them should work okay. I'll probably need to follow up with you on, on that one. Warn me next time that I'm going to have some tough questions. <laughs> the other part, I guess the part two to that question is he's wondering if he needs to, and I think you answered it, he probably needs to go at 10 gallons, right? Yeah, the, the more water is always um, better when it comes to coverage and because most of those, um, so the group 14s don't move a lot. Um, they, they do move a little bit, but they don't move a lot in the plant, so coverage is key. And clearly uh, the diquats, which is a contact herbicide, don't, uh, don't really move at all. So um, you do need to have that water volume up as high as you can in order to get the best coverage that you can. Okay, uh, just going to check with Lori to see if she got any questions. Uh, Lori, any questions for Tammy? No, I don't have any. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Tammy. I know you're busy at a potato weeds meeting, so uh, thanks for coming on and spending time with us, and we will be talking to you again. All right, thanks, Lionel. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll uh, continue on with... Uh, the rest of the uh, crop talk. And uh, as usual, I like to put up the weather report for uh, for the past week. And uh, as you can see over the past week, we uh, we didn't receive a whole bunch of rainfall uh, throughout the whole Southwest here. I think uh, there was some spotty showers that went through and some spotty thunderstorms. So some people, or some areas might've got uh, a little bit more rain than they might be on, on the map today. But uh, I think in general, we uh, we were uh, very limited in the amount of rain we got. Uh, with the heat we're getting, we're definitely getting our growing degree days going up, so we're getting closer to normal there, and our heat units are following as long uh, as well along with them. So uh, that's a that's a good sign, uh, especially for some of the uh, the uh, crops that need the heat, like corn, soybeans, and uh, and sunflowers. And then when you look at our percent of normal, you still see that there's areas that are, are definitely lower than their normal amount. But I think on average, we're starting to get a little bit closer to, uh, to where, we, uh, where we should be. So uh, another rainfall, uh, it was probably good for, would be good right now. Uh, and then probably in a couple of weeks for, especially for the soybean crop, because uh, rains in August for soybean fill are probably the, the key. A lot of those soybean crops are, are just nicely potting now. So for pod fill and pod development, uh, a rain then would definitely be, uh, be a help. Something that uh, happened the other morning, uh, this was the morning of July the 30th, uh, so this would have been in the Show Lake area uh, at about uh, 7 in the morning, it was plus 5, and that same morning in the Burtail Valley, uh, there was reports of plus 1, so uh, a little bit scary for this time of year, I, I think... Uh, uh, we have uh, been getting some reports that we might not get the uh, the long extended falls that we might be used to. So uh, this was kind of just a little bit of a wake up call just to see how cool it can get, especially after uh, uh, about three or four days of plus 30 weather than uh, waking up to this one morning. And what did that plus 30 weather bring? Well, we are starting to see some areas and uh, areas that maybe were needing a little bit of rainfall uh, versus that heat causing some of the canola flowers to abort. Uh, you can see this on ridges and fields uh, if you're driving by and not just canola fields, if you're driving by some of the cereal crops that are out there as well. Uh, you see just the uh, the burning in of the crop, uh, just needing some moisture and, and in the heat conditions causing that those plants just to ripen in a little bit quick. And I think uh, with uh, the forecast for the next couple of days here, we probably could see a little bit more of this. Uh, probably seeing the aborting of the, uh, the canola and more in the uh, later seeded crops, uh, the reseeded crops. 
And uh, I think uh, something that we uh, are pretty much accustomed to every year, but uh, this year I think we're seeing it uh, mainly in those later seeded crops right now, being that most of the, uh, the early or normally seeded crops are, uh, are going out of, uh, are pretty much fully out of bloom right now. Leaf disease. Uh, leaf disease is definitely starting to show up. Uh, uh, this field was sprayed with a fungicide. These are the flag leaves. So uh, we've had conditions for uh, the leaf disease to reinfect the flag leaf now. And uh, so uh, producers are definitely uh, going to be seeing some disease and this is going to make the crop change fairly fast in the field as well. Um, for producers that uh, didn't spray, uh, we'll probably even see the change in the fields a lot faster. Um, as you can see, this flag leaf here, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of the leaf is is being covered with disease already, and it won't take long for that to uh, that to to cover the rest of the leaf. The good part about it is this field, uh, the head was in the uh, soft dose stage, well, the milk to soft dose stage, sort of. Uh, stage of the plant and uh, one thing too is the head also will collect enough sun to help finish the, the, the development of the seed so as long as those flag leaves can last on for about another week 10 days uh, we'll probably see a lot of those uh, heads filling to their uh, normal or their their capability and so uh, those ones uh, will still be okay uh, for crops that were, weren't sprayed, we might have some issues there with some of the, the heads not filling to their full potential. Been doing a fair few uh, fusarium and disease uh, uh, checks out in the fields uh, these last little while here and uh, fusarium surveys, uh, the amounts so far are very low. Uh, and that's not just for the Southwest. Uh, most of the people I've been talking to uh, have, uh, aren't seeing a lot of it yet. Uh, again, uh, I think uh, maybe some of the uh, early seeded or later seeded uh, cereals might show uh, a little bit more of it. But right now, the majority uh, is looking pretty good. Grasshoppers, uh, grasshoppers are definitely starting to become an issue uh, and they're not a, an issue throughout the whole area, but they, uh, there are high levels in some areas. Uh, I'm usually finding them more in the lighter soils where they become more of a problem. And uh, right now they're uh, reaching the adult stage and at that stage they're capable of moving into, into the crops and doing, uh, doing a fair bit more damage. Um, and actually the worst spots I'm seeing them right now is in uh, overgrazed uh, uh, pastures, uh, pastures that were cattle were let out early in the spring and uh, they never really got ahead. And uh, for some reason they seem to be able to feed in those and stay in the sun at the same time. And they just seem to be a lot more uh, aggressive in those, uh, in those fields. But uh, seeing them in every crop from canola to sunflowers uh, to cereal crops. Uh, right now on the heavy crops, I'm mainly seeing them just on the field edges and really haven't, haven't had a bad enough uh, where somebody's actually had to spray a lot for them yet. I know a couple of producers that did some some headlands, but besides that, it's uh, it hasn't been uh, overly bad yet. Uh, one of the things to remember, and Tammy mentioned that as well, is um, there if you have an issue with uh, grasshoppers, we do have uh, there is pre-harvest intervals for the application. And basically, if you're getting to the point where you're getting to be about three weeks and under for uh, for app for uh, before harvest, uh, you're down to about three products. You got Corrigen, Melathion, and EcoBrand. And EcoBrand is more of a uh, um, uh, bait that you put out, and and the grasshoppers eat it as compared to the Corrigen and Melathion would be. Uh, a spray that you would use. And um, uh, I got this information off the uh, Manitoba crop uh, pest update. And that's something that uh, John Gavlowski and Dave Kaminsky and uh, Tammy Jones put together on a weekly basis. And uh, there's the link to our website. Uh, so if you uh, wanna go to that, uh, it uh, there's uh, 
a weekly one that comes up and there's also all of the uh, previous ones on there as well. A little bit about sunflowers for the next few slides here as I haven't talked a lot about sunflowers this year, uh, but uh, in my drive uh, doing uh, disease surveys over the past uh, week here, I've been starting to see more and more fields and figured maybe I'd just mention a few things about them and then it's kind of the right time of, right staging time to get out there and monitor for a few things that we can uh, can control yet. So uh, a lot of the sunflowers uh, I've been seeing are in the R5 stage and uh, the 0.1 stage is, uh, that's a percentage. So that would be like 10% uh, uh, heading or the open head and uh, as the heads open more you go from R5.1 to R5.5, R5.6 and basically that's just percentages going up so 10%, 20%, 60%, 70% so that's that's how uh, that standard is, uh, is set up for staging and at this stage is a pretty good stage to get out there and start looking for rust in sunflowers. And uh, uh, basically the most damaging occur, uh, yield damage occurs in uh, late July to early August, so right around this time period. And this is when the symptoms will start showing up. Rust pustules are very similar to what they would be in cereal crops. So um, basically there's, uh, but, uh, for sunflowers, if you look on the undersides of the leaves, you'll see um, the, the pustules uh, and on the top side of the leaf, you'll see uh, pustules as well, but just a different coloring. And with sunflowers, uh, uh, rust becomes more severe uh, with the later planted crops than, and than the earlier planted crops. Um, warm, moist weather, so something like we've been getting uh, will definitely help uh, the rust multiply and it can spread uh, very fast through the field. I guess one of the things I noticed with uh, sunflowers and rust is uh, because of the size of the leaf, you can get a fair bit of, uh, of, uh, of uh, spores built up on one leaf and if you get a lot of wind, those spores can move a long distance. Uh, economic thresholds, uh, anywhere from three to five percent of uh, uh, of the leaf uh, of the upper four leaves, and then when you look at the, the picture here, I've got the leaf turned over there, and you can see the pustules on the bottom side there. Um, basically, that would be a uh, time to look at doing some spraying, and uh, there are a couple of fungicides that are are available to spray for rust in sunflowers. Uh, there's the trazoles and the strobulins, and uh, basically uh, this staging or at this time of year, um, probably the trizoles are the one that you'd be using now if you go out in the field and you're finding rust already in the field. Uh, they're more of a, a stop it as it where it is kind of uh, product as compared to the strobulins where they'll. Uh, more of a protectant, so that would be something that you would have applied, uh, you know, maybe a week ago uh, before the the rust actually showed up. So almost like a, uh, using a product for sclerotinia and canola, you kind of spray before the problems there, as compared to the other one where you can spray and, and help control or reduce the spread of some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, disease. And there's just a couple of the pictures of the bottom side. I took this off the internet. Uh, a couple of pictures of the bottom side of the leaf and the upper side of the leaf. You can see definitely a different color. And I guess the big key is uh, walk through the field. You come out of the field and you've got uh, a bunch of uh, brown rust on your jeans, uh, on your shirt. Uh, you know that you've uh, uh, that there, there's an issue out there and you probably should be investigating it a little bit farther. Well, we're still talking about sunflowers. There's been a little bit of talk uh, lately about the banded sunflower moth showing up. And uh, it's also the right time to be wa uh, watching. So if you're scouting for rust, it's a good time to be monitoring for them right now. Best time to monitor for them is in the early morning uh, or the later evenings. That's when they're most active. Top picture here shows the, the banded sunflower moth. So uh, when it sits on the leaf, it's uh, it's very narrow, it brings its uh, wings right in 
and it's almost uh, uh, like a tube type shape, but uh, definitely has the band on its back that you'll notice, uh, which uh, it gives it its name, the banded, uh, banded sunflower moth. Uh, economic thresholds are uh, one uh, banded sunflower moth per two plants uh, is usually something where you might be looking at needing some uh, to do some spraying. I think at that point you definitely need to be watching the field and seeing, uh, seeing and monitoring it on a daily basis. What they do is they'll lay eggs and then the larvae burrow themselves into the seed and they feed on the on the inside of the seed. So uh, probably more of an issue in confection sunflowers than they are in uh, oil seed oil sunflowers. Uh, I guess the biggest thing is depending on the numbers. If uh, even in oil seeds, uh, if they uh, the numbers are high enough, they definitely will look at or you can definitely see some yield reductions uh, with uh, just basically uh, lighter seed and uh, and and seed not developing depending on the on the time that they uh, they got into the uh, the seed. Um, Insecticides, if you're gonna spray for the abandoned moth, uh, I mentioned that they're more active in the early mornings and evenings, so probably best times to be spraying. Also, by doing it that way, you are uh, gonna do less damage to our pollinators and because uh, the bees are usually more active during uh, the heat of the day. Uh, there are a few, uh, um, uh, I guess uh, beneficial insects that also help control the, the moth too. So make sure your count numbers are, are fairly close uh, to the economic uh, benefit uh, and also travel throughout the field. Don't just go to one spot and if you see them because uh, uh, they don't necessarily have to be throughout the whole field as well. Couple other ones I wanted to put up. Um, I've been getting quite a few calls. I should say quite a few. I've been getting some calls regarding trying to figure out or estimating yields for cereals. And um, uh, I guess what's uh, uh, creating a few of the calls is uh, there's there's some talk about uh, uh, a shortage of feed this year um, due to the dry conditions, uh, especially in some areas. And um, some producers are looking at selling some crop standing and uh, wanting to figure out uh, ways to determine uh, yield. And uh, so uh, but I did some looking and was able to find some pretty good uh, information as to some easy ways of determining your what approximate yields will be. Now these are, you know, approximates. Uh, that's exactly the word. Uh, you know, the depending on where you are in the field, uh, depending on the evenness of the field, uh, this will give you some. Uh, this will help you figure out, uh, you know, what a, an approximate yield would be. But uh, you're rarely your fields are perfectly uniform, so you could be that close. But anyways, for uh, wheat, uh, you take the kernels per spike. Uh, times the amount of spikes per three foot row and then you multiply it by 0 0.0319 and that should give you bushels per acre. Now barley, the only thing that changes in this formula is is the, the number you multiply at the end. So for barley it's 0 0.0389 and for oats it's 0 0.0504. The only other thing that would change uh, would be is if your width of spacing on your on your seating equipment. So if you're in a six inch row, uh, multiply the grain yield estimate by 1.17 uh, because uh, the above formulas are used for a seven inch row. So, and there's the numbers below for you to use if you go to a wider spacing as well. So while I put that one up, I figured I might as well put one up for, uh, for canola as well because guys are going to be out in the fields checking the canola crops for birth of armyworms over the next little while as well as diamondback moss. So if you're out there, might as well grab a couple plants and try to determine what the, what the yields will be. So you uh, take the number of pods per plant times the number of seeds per pod and these would be averages, right? So the averages, average number of pods per plant times the average number of seeds per pod uh, times the plants per square foot times 0 0.00084 and that'll give you a rough estimate of what the uh, canola canola yield will be. So 
plants per square foot, uh, depending on the, uh, the, uh, the, this is gonna be really difficult to do this year because depending on where you are in your field, we're probably gonna see different amounts. And then I have seen uh, in one, one instance for sure uh, where one, there would have been one plant per square foot, but uh, that plant was probably three times the normal size of a normal canola plant. So I think the, the key there to doing it when canola, with canola would be trying to find an average spot in the field that uh, hadn't been uh, hurt by uh, some type of uh, injury this spring, whether it be flea beetles or cutworms. With that, uh, unless there's any questions, I'm going to keep going. And uh, again, the seasonal crop reports are always up and being updated. I already mentioned about the insect, weed, and disease updates, so definitely go check them out on our website. The uh, ag extension people for the province. So if you have any questions, uh, please uh, get a hold of these people. Um, Tammy just sent me a note here and she says, I did confirm that in wheat, aim, diquat, and heat are options for drying down volunteer canola. I guess Volterra may also fit the bill for wheat pre-harvest. So that goes back to the, uh, the question regarding volunteer canola in wheat and what the producer could do to uh, help get the uh, canola to dry down. So thanks for getting back to us, Tammy. And join us next week, August the 7th. Uh, that'll be the next uh, broadcast. And uh, if you're wanting to view the webinars online or previous webinars, uh, those are, there's our links right there. So uh, with that, thanks for attending and see you next week.